Heritage Church, and I'm a little bit loud, I think. My wife tells me that all the time. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 3. We are moving right along in our study of the book of Daniel, and this morning we're going to be look at when civil disobedience is next to godliness. And before we get into that, we need to remember that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And also, we need to prove ourselves doers of the Word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. So we are, as I stated, looking at this idea of when civil disobedience is appropriate, and we see it uh, several times through the book of Daniel. And this is the first, actually. Um, just to remind us, what is the book of Daniel dealing with? It's dealing with the sovereignty of God over all of his creation um, and over all of the happenings of men on earth. And so we have a king, Nebuchadnezzar, who uh, carries the first four chapters of the book of Daniel. And this king, Nebuchadnezzar, was a great and mighty king. His nation, the, the nation over which he ruled, we saw last week, was that head of gold and that vision that he had, that dream that he had had. And um, that the description that Daniel had given was the fact that God had placed him in that position to, to lead this nation, to be the dominant world power at the time. He, in his ruling, was a, a, a complete autocrat. There was no one who could hold him accountable. And he was able to, as, as we're going to see in, in Daniel chapter 5, as Daniel uh, speaks to uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son, that Nebuchadnezzar himself was able to, he could keep anyone alive he wanted to, he could kill anyone he wanted to, he could do all of this without being held accountable at all. And God had allowed him in that position um, and then we see those kingdoms that come after his, each one, the elements diminishing in value and in, uh, in weight, but increasingly growing harder and harder. And now we come to uh, this presentation of this image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar built, and he planted it in the plain of Dora, it says. And it's, it's going to cause some problems for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At least it's going to cause some perceived problems for them. What we're going to find, obviously, as you all know, you probably heard this story a million times growing up in church. If you grew up in church, you, you heard about the, the, uh, the Asbestos brothers, right? Right? My shack, your shack, and a bungalow. Yeah. I just love that joke. I mean, I, I, got, I got that from... Uh, Dr. Kaiser, and he's, that's just a funny joke to me. I'm sure you're getting tired of it, but I don't care. Uh, anyway, um, and so you know the story. You know that in the end, they're not going to burn in the fire. And in fact, uh, the uh, pre-incarnate Son of God is going to show up on the scene and rescue them from that. So let's just dig in a little bit this morning. We want to remember where we are, this middle section of the book, chapters 2 through 7, that chiasmic structure there that brings into focus in, in chapters 4 and 5 the fact that God is sovereign over all nations, over all men. Um, but here it's going to demonstrate the arrogance. And again in chapter 4 we're going to see arrogance of man. And then again in chapter 5 we're going to see the arrogance of man time and time again as uh, these kings try to strut their stuff in front of the God of Israel. And so this morning, obviously, we're looking at Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. And so this is what we're going to see this morning. First is the call for national assembly. Second, we see the three accused before the king. Then we have Nebuchadnezzar confronting the three. And then finally, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand firm against the king. So let's begin by reading this morning, starting in verse 1. 
Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the commandment is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, which is actually, I think, pronounced trigon. Uh, Jim and I were talking about how to pronounce that in uh, words like that in Hebrew earlier. Jim's a Hebrew scholar. Um, Psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you, and they do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the, flute, uh, of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that we handle it correctly this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Actually, uh, Jim and I have been schooled by uh, Chris Cohn in how to pronounce some of these words, so neither one of us are Hebrew scholars, but... Anyway, so we're going to begin this morning by looking at this uh, call for a national assembly. And the first thing we see is Nebuchadnezzar's golden image being expressed in verse 1. He made a golden image, uh, and it, it says that the height was 60 cubits, and its width was 6 cubits, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So the first thing we need to notice is this an image of Nebuchadnezzar, or is it an image of his gods? And the simple truth is, we take it normally, we just simply think, well, it's Nebuchadnezzar building an image of himself. But the truth is that the text doesn't tell us. It seems like it possibly is, and especially when we look back at chapter 2, we see that he is depicted as um, the head of gold. Maybe he decided... I'm not just the head, I'm the whole statue. And that's possible, but it just simply doesn't 
tell us? And why is he building such an image? Well, in uh, the, the mid-500s, uh, after he had become ruler of, of Babylon, there was a coup attempt for about a year. Uh, someone, and I don't know who the fellows were, but someone tried to uh, conduct a coup uh, against Nebuchadnezzar, and eventually he crushed it. And it is very understandable then, and this was a common practice in those days, that he built this image as an image of himself, and then called all of these leaders together to order them or to force them to make a statement, a public statement of fealty to him as the divine, not divine, that's the wrong word to use, but as the, uh, the ultimate ruler of Babylon. In other words, it was for them to prove to him that they were not involved in any coup attempt and would not in the future be involved in any coup attempt. And ha had they not bowed to this image, uh, then they would, of course, as he says, be thrown into this burning furnace, okay? And so it seems like the furnace itself was, was near uh, to where this image was, and so um, it was probably what was used to actually uh, form the image. All right, so what do we find? Is this a solid gold image? Now, these may be minor points, but it's interesting to know anyway, and so people think, well, this was a, 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 a solid gold image uh, image of Nebuchadnezzar? Well, probably not. Um, it's been estimated that if it, with the dimensions that it's given, uh, 60 feet, uh, excuse me, 60 cubits by 6 cubits, it would have taken 5,467 cubic inches or, or a cubic inches of, of gold. And they said that uh, even Nebuchadnezzar at the height of his rain would not have had that much gold. So most likely it was like all the other images that were made, uh, idols made in those days. It was probably made of wood, possibly uh, brick, pr but probably wood and overlaid with gold. And we find this practice common. As a matter of fact, Isaiah discusses that in Isaiah 4019, speaking of the false gods uh, of the nations that had been adopted by Israel, he says, as for the idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. So this discusses the process of the making of idols in those days. And then again, Jeremiah reminding Israel exactly why they are in the predicament that they find themselves. In Jeremiah 10, 3 through 9, he describes this idea of this delusion that someone can make something, and just because they make it into an image of a man or a beast or whatever, and then cover it with gold, it's their God. And he says, for the customs of the peoples are delusion. Because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. They decorate it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers so that it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm, nor can they do good. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and great is your name and might. Who would, who would not fear you, O King of the nations? Indeed, it is your due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. But they are altogether stupid and foolish in their discipline of delusion. Their idol is wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. The work of a craftsman and of the hands of a goldsmith. Violet and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skilled men. So Jeremiah reiterates here the foolishness of worshiping these idols that had been made out of wood and simply covered in gold and somehow that was to be a God. And so if we bring that into our day, what do we, uh, obviously we usually don't make uh, idols in this fashion. We don't ca have bronze idols and things that we bow down and worship most of the time. Some people do still. But what about you and me? What do we put up as our idols? We can put up all kinds of things as our idols. We, uh, when we're dating someone, uh, we can put up that other person as an idol. That's the person that we, that we just 
almost worship. Or if we're, even when we're married, we could do the same thing with our spouse, our, our finances. We put our trust and our hope in our finances. Uh, you can list any number of things that we in modern day make as our own idols. And regardless of what it might be, the conclusion is always the same. That it is a delusion to put our faith in anything other than God, in His Son, Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, we could even look at our own spiritual life. If, if, if when I was a lost person, of course I was, only, you know, I was very young when I be, uh, came to the Lord, but even then, what was I trusting in uh, for my own well-being? It might have been my parents. As we get older, we might put our faith in, in some other religious practice or even symbols uh, that would act like idols. And people put their faith in themselves that I'll just take care of myself. I'll be fine when I stand before the big guy. All my good things will outweigh my bad things and I'll be good to go. All of those are similar to, if not exactly like, the worship of idols that took place back in the ancient days. And so we can set up any number of things in our own lives as idols. But the, again, the outcome is always the same. It is futile. It is a delusion. Uh, as the writer of Jeremiah says, or actually Jeremiah says, it is stupid and foolish this discipline of delusion. And so we need to be sure that we don't delude ourselves. And that's why when we look at James chapter 1, where he says we need to be diligent, uh, we need to uh, 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 do the word that we read, we need to obey the word, because if we don't, then we are practicing a delusion. That somehow just reading the Bible, but then not obeying the Word of God is a good thing. And in actuality, it's a delusional way of thinking. All right? So that's the idol of gold. But the dimensions, what happens in the mentioning of these dimensions, that it is 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, regardless of purpose, what happens here is this idol that we find Nebuchadnezzar making and setting up introduces the number six into the body of Scripture in the sense that it is related, or uh, maybe a better way of saying it, it foreshadows what is to come. And we see that in, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 18, we see a very similar thing going on. He says, uh, it was given to the beast to breathe, to breathe life into the image of the beast uh, so that the image of the beast, uh, I'm sorry, I think it wasn't the beast that was given the, 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 the uh, ability to do this. It was the false prophet. But anyway, uh, he could breathe life into the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a, a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. So we see similarities going on here. What we see in Nebuchadnezzar is a foreshadowing of, of, of a type of uh, the Antichrist that is to come, who is going to set up his own image and force the worship of that. So we can see that similarities taking place there. So it's an image made of wood, covered with gold, its dimensions are that it is around 90 feet high and about 9 feet wide. And then it was set up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon proper. And so here we have a map that shows us Babylon. You see the red circle there. And the plain of Dura, here's the thing, there were at least three Duras at that time. And the reason that's important is, is it goes back to who wrote the book of Daniel. 
As you recall, liberals want to place the writing of the book of Daniel somewhere further towards the uh, reign of Antiochus Epiphanes in the, around 163 in that, in that area. And so what would be written in the book of Daniel is not prophecy, but history. That makes a big difference. It makes a very big difference. Uh, and so why is this important? Well, as one author wrote that a, a Palestinian Jew during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes would not have known about these other two Duras. So he would not have known exactly where this uh, image was set up. The Dura that is mentioned here is somewhere uh, several miles southeast of the city of Babylon. And that first, uh, excuse me, that uh, Palestinian Jew during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes would not have known all of these things. We'll say, well, okay, so who cares? Well, I care because, and you should too, because it demonstrates that whoever wrote the book of Daniel had to be living at least near the time that this took place. And we know and believe, because Jesus himself said it, that this is Daniel, the prophet, as Jesus identifies him, who wrote the book of Daniel. So it gives us yet another reason to trust the word of God. And so here we have it. It's 90 feet tall. Depending on which measurement of a cubit you use, a cubit could be 18 or 20 inches. So it's somewhere between uh, 90 feet and 100 feet and 9 to 10 feet wide. Well, the purpose is that this thing is massive and it's going to be seen a long distance off. It was a sight to behold. Now, I want to recognize something very quickly here, and it is this, the repetition that we see. Nebuchadnezzar, it, you see the number of verses where his name is repeated over and over and over again. Uh, every writer uses some sort of, uh, uh, of literary device to get his point across. Repetition is a, is a very big thing used by both the Hebrew and the Greeks uh, when writing because it identifies something very important. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Well, the next thing we see in verses 2 through 7 then is the assembly of the nation's officials. So Nebuchadnezzar the king set word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And so the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So you see all the repetition taking place there. So again, we have this repetition, the titles of those who are assembled. Now it's only repeated once, it's stated and then repeated, but there's a reason for that. And then there's the repetition of the instruments. I mean, go through and read this a few times out loud. You run out of breath eventually. You're reading the same thing over and over again. But there's a purpose for that. And what is that purpose? Why all the repetition? Well, Daniel's a writer. And have you ever read a boring book? They're usually, you know, called textbooks. But anyway... Uh, have you ever read a boring novel? Are you awake? There's no response. I mean, you're just all staring at me like I have three eyes or something. I have four. They're, anyway, yeah, I, I've, I've never really read. I don't read a lot of novels. Most of everything I read is, is you know, instructional of some sort. But I've never read the novels I have read. They've never been boring. They've always done something to capture your attention, right? Well... What Daniel's doing here is he is building the suspense by repeating the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar's the man. You cross Nebuchadnezzar, you remember what he told the wise men. I'm going to rip your limb from limb and I'm going to make your house into a public bathroom. And so Daniel is playing on that. Well, why then repeat the names of all of these uh, titles of those who come to be assembled? Because he is building uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, um, 
intensity of what he's trying to state by making sure that we know that Nebuchadnezzar's the man and all of these other rulers and governors and satraps and flytraps and all of that bow to Nebuchadnezzar. All right? What about the instruments? Well, apparently the music played a very important role in this worship service, if you will. And so again, that you can just hear the music building with the repetition of these instruments. And so Daniel is really trying to make us understand the significance of what's taking place here. And so in verse 4, Then the herald loudly proclaimed to you, The command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up all but three. So you can see the desired outcome was met. That these people who had been gathered for the purpose of displaying their loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar did exactly what he said to do except for these three troublemaking, rabble-rousing Jews, right? So what do we find then? Beginning of verse 8, we see the Chaldean accusers. Let me go back real quick. So you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're being brought before the king with these accusations. All right, so the Chaldean accusers in verses 8 through 12. Look at what we have. For this reason, what reason? Because they didn't bow down at the proper time. Certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. We'll just stop there for just a moment. What's important about this? Well, the Chaldeans, you remember, they're the, they're the high-class wise men. I mean, they're the upper class, the upper crust. But not only that, the Chaldeans were the original Babylonians. They originally occupied that land before it was taken over by Nebuchadnezzar, um, Nebuchadnezzar's father. Okay, So they are insulted by the fact that these three wise men, excuse me, these three uh, uh, Jews uh, are in a position that is over them and over their land. That's a position that they should be occupying. And what we find here is a early taste of anti-Semitism. The Chaldeans hated the Jews. Pretty much seems like almost everybody hated the Jews or does hate the Jews, right? And so that's exactly what they're doing. They see a chance to point out something that these Jews did in order that they're going to be put into the burning furnace. And guess what? I'm going to get to take their position as a Chaldean. So I'm going to be elevated after they get their pants on fire, right? So it's an, a form of anti-Semitism we see here. Verse 11 then, whoever does not fall down and worship and be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing will be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. So we have again here a, a re repetition of the punishment. And you can see it's repeated several times. But then something interesting in verse 12, it says there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon. You hear what's going on there. You did this, O king. It's a very subtle and yet very true accusation against Nebuchadnezzar. So they're, they're feeling their oats a little bit here. And so they bring this accusation against Nebuchadnezzar himself for appointing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to this administration over the province of Babylon. Now, another interesting thing that we find in verse 12 is that it gives us somewhat of a time frame of when this took place. We know that it chronologically took place following chapter 2. 
Why? How do we know that? Well, because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had already been appointed to their position of authority. And so the book of Daniel is not always chronological, but we can see that chapters 1, 2, and 3 are. Okay, just a little side note. So what is or what are the accusations brought against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, here they are. Here are the accusations. They have paid no attention to you. In other words, just like that child uh, when they're young and you say, look, son, daughter of mine, don't do X, Y, or Z. And they immediately start doing that little, oh yeah, you, you going to stop me, right? So that's kind of what we see the accusation being here. You have said to do, I can see some reaction in the crowd that their children were more so like that than others. But anyway, you can see here that uh, they're saying, look, Nebuchadnezzar, you made a command and they refused to listen to you. They're, they're, they're thumping their chests uh, at the thought of you trying to make them do something. But not only that, he says, they do not provide, they say, they do not provide service to your gods. That's literally what it says here. They are not serving your gods. They're not, and what kind of service would that be? Well, I mean, those, in those days, the, the food sacrifices and things like that were in order to, uh, not just to placate the God, but to, to, to feed his appetite or her appetite. And they would not provide that kind of service. And then finally, they do not bow down in homage to the golden image is the third accusation here. And that idea of bowing down in homage and the providing service are both, they're kind of interchangeable in that they're both referencing different uh, parts of worship of this image and of the gods of Nebuchadnezzar. All right, well, then that takes us to verses 13 and 15 where Nebuchadnezzar confronts them. And we're going to see something a little bit interesting here. In verse 13, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and in anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, very well. But if you do not worship you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. What God is there who can deliver you out of my hand? Bold statement by Nebuchadnezzar. Well, the first thing we see, obviously, is that Nebuchadnezzar was not a happy camper at this time. He got very angry. As a matter of fact, it said he responded with wrath, raging, raging anger. And then he brought them and questioned them. But... Not only did he question them, he gave them a second chance. Was that part of the original deal? No. The original deal was, look, if you don't do this, immediately you will be cast into the fiery furnace. Well, why, what's the deal? Why is he doing this? I think it goes back to chapter 1. And then again to the end of chapter 2. Chapter 1, he questioned Daniel uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he brought them and gave them oral exam and, and tested their knowledge, tested their wisdom, and he found that they were ten times better than even the older, more accomplished, more mature, more experienced wise men and Chaldeans. And so Nebuchadnezzar here is demonstrating the fact that he had a special um, uh, a special relationship with these men. Probably not as close as it was to Daniel, but these men uh, seemed to hold a special place for him. So instead of immediately casting them into uh, the furnace, he gave them a second chance. We can also see the fact that uh, uh, in, in chapter 1, it's stated that God gave them favor before not only Nebuchadnezzar, but the other leaders of that time. And so we see that uh, affecting the way that Nebuchadnezzar dealt with these three. Well, what does that teach us? Well, you know, sometimes when you uh, work for somebody else, you might get crosshaired with the boss, or you may have someone in your office that's giving you a hard time, or, or out in the field, whatever it might be. And, and, uh, and 
what do we need to do in those times? Well, in those times, we need to ask the Lord for favor in the eyes of these people. I've done that myself before. And God has answered my prayer. Now, does that mean he'll always do it? No, it doesn't. But uh, God cares for his people. And we can see that grace that he allowed these men to experience through Nebuchadnezzar, the favor that he made sure they had, we can see it carrying over into this chapter. It's a work of God in the lives of these three. And you and I need to practice the same thing. Now, I'm not saying they asked for that. It's something that was given. We don't know if they asked for it or not. But what we can know is this. God gave it. And Scripture tells us if we pray, if we lack wisdom, we can ask for wisdom. Well, if we, if we need wisdom in a situation, we ask for it. If we need grace in the eyes of of the person who is our boss or, or whatever, we can ask for that. And God might do it if it's in his will. And so we see that favor that God had bestowed upon them earlier is carried over into this portion of their lives as Nebuchadnezzar kind of goes against his word and offers them a second chance. Well... The bad thing Nebuchadnezzar did is that he challenged God. It's not the only bad thing he did. I mean, you set up an idol and try to force people to worship it. That, that's a bad thing. But, but the ultimate thing we find here is that he challenged God. And it's very reminiscent of what we find in, in ch uh, passages such as 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 33, this is the representative of the king of Assyria as he comes against Hezekiah and the city of Jerusalem, having already destroyed Israel in the north. He comes against Judah, and this is what the representative of the king of Assyria says. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva, or Eva? Have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their land from my hand that the Lord, and the word Lord here is, is that uh, representation of the personal name of God, Yahweh, who among all the gods of lands have delivered their land from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Then again, the same, uh, same situation but from a different author giving us a different perspective in Isaiah 36 verses 18 through 20. Beware that Hezekiah does not mislead you saying the Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the land of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? And the, uh, where are the gods of Sephravim? And uh, when have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered the land from my hand that the Lord would deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Sounds very similar to Nebuchadnezzar, does it not? What God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Well... We're going to find out. So the final thing we're going to look at this morning is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They stand firm against the king. So they're given this chance. All you got to do is bow down. You don't even have to mean it. How would he know? If you meant it, it's just a physical gesture, right? Well, some of us may think like that. And some of us may have reacted like that. Who knows? But as Dr. Paul Benware says, compromise in truth and in life is so common among, among believers today that we see the three as being a little extreme. Well, the Bible and history testify that when a person fears God, they will not fear men. But when they fear men, it is because they do not fear God. So it's easy for us to compromise. It would be very easy to compromise. The path of least resistance, correct? It's, it always seems like the best way to save you some pain, some suffering. But these men were dedicated to the Lord their God, even in captivity. And so what, how do they respond? Well, verse 
16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Very bold statement in the face of a man who's about to kill them. So here's what they're saying. Number one, we have no need to return a response to you. We don't, we don't have to tell you anything. We could just stand here and let you do whatever you want to do, king. But there's a purpose behind them answering, and that is what is to follow. Verse 17, if our God whom we serve chooses, he is capable of rescuing us. He will save us. And speaking of physical salvation. And if it's in his will, Mr. Nebuchadnezzar, he will do that. This next statement is somewhat puzzling to me. Because they just said it may be that he'll rescue us from this situation or he may not. But then they turn around and in verse 17 and say, he will rescue us from your hand. That's a positive statement of fact. Well, what are they talking about? Well, it seems to me, and, and I, I didn't see anyone really comment on this, but it seems to me that what they're saying is that either by rescuing us out of the fiery furnace itself or through death, he is going to rescue us from your hand. I think that's possibly the best answer that I could give anyway. That they're looking at this, whether we live or die, it's kind of like what Paul says. If for me to live is Christ. In other words, for me to live is a, is a further propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and establishing churches and having people come to know the truth. But for me to die is gain. In other words, if I die, what have I lost? Nothing. As a matter of fact, I gain the full experience of the new life I have in Christ. I think it's a similar thing that they're saying here. And then finally, in verse 18, they say, we're going to trust him even if he chooses not to save us. That is their bold statement. But what we need to understand is that in that day to challenge Nebuchadnezzar's gods was to challenge Nebuchadnezzar himself. And so the result is that they're cast into this burning fire and we're going to see the remainder of that, Lord willing, next week. So here's what we've seen. We've seen this call for a national assembly. It's the, for the purpose of, of uh, pronouncing their loyalty to the king. And then we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because they refuse to bow, they're, they're accused before the king. Then when Nebuchadnezzar confronts him, he does so in furious anger and yet gives them a second chance. But we see in the long run, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego continue to stand firm against the king. So here's what we see the king doing. First of all, he's attempting to force the three to serve the image. And he's attempting, them to, uh, attempting to force them to worship not only the image, but his gods. And he refused to allow any dissent, attempting to destroy any opposition to his authority. But what we see in the three is that they knew God's word. They believed God's word. They feared God more than Nebuchadnezzar. They esteemed God more than Nebuchadnezzar. And they were willing to die for their obedience to God, being unwilling to compromise in the least. So how about you? Believer, are, are we ready to live like that? Are we ready to stand up? and serve the Lord regardless of what may be coming to our way in the future? We don't know what's going to come to pass. They may someday outlaw Christianity. Are we, going to, are we going to sit back and say, well, okay, I guess there's nothing I can do. Or are we going to stand up and say, I will serve and worship the one true God regardless of what you say? That's what the three did. Well, how about this? Do you fear the Lord? Or are you here this morning, maybe you don't even understand the fear of the Lord. 
Maybe you've never come to realize who he is exactly. Well, Scripture tells us, obviously, that he's the creator of all things. He's the master of all. Again, I always go back and reference how Daniel depicts him. He is the God of the heavens. He rules over all of creation. He created man in his image. But as we know, our forefathers, our foreparents, rebelled against him. In particular, Adam rebelled against God and sin entered the world. And thus, all of us born in the image of Adam bear his sin nature. And we are separated from our Creator God by that sin nature. And there's no way to escape it. But Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the, the one Son of God, came and took on humanity. He became a man, lived a perfect life, and died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin. So that if we put our trust in Him, he will save us and He will take away that sin nature. He will deal with that sin nature through Himself. We'll, we will be placed in Christ, in His righteousness. And we will spend eternity in a joy and a bliss that we can't understand at this time, having escaped the judgment that is to come. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I would plead with you to do that today. Father, we thank You for Your Word and pray that we've handled it correctly this morning. And ask that we would continue to examine it and to learn and to see what kind of lessons we can glean from these three uh, brave, trusting souls who were willing to put their lives on the line to be obedient to you. Help us to adopt that same attitude, the same faithfulness that they exhibited. May we be good stewards of the grace that you have given. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and